our species, our designation of our species is Homo sapiens sapiens, mm -hmm. two sapiens. And that is the one who thinks and knows he or she thinks, Homo sapiens sapiens. But we're, we're all stuck in the thinking instead of being able to step out of it and know that we're thinking, that you are not your thoughts. And when you get that, then you have much more control over your life. I'd love to dig into like, how did you get into all of this? Because you've got a fascinating story of, of a whirlwind of different careers and things that you were doing before this. Uh, but to get people up to date, how did this idea of meditation, like what's the backstory here? Yeah, I was not particularly interested in meditation. I, uh, I as I generally tell the story, it kind of started when I had a panic attack on Good Morning America many years ago. So back in 2004. And how did that happen? The backstory there is that I had spent a lot of time as an ambitious young reporter after 9-11 in Iraq and Afghanistan and Pakistan and the Middle East. And it had been very exciting, but also it kind of screwed me up a little bit. And and instead of dealing with it in a straightforward fashion, I had started to self-medicate with cocaine and ecstasy. And even though I wasn't high when I was on the air that morning, it was enough, according to this doctor, to change my brain chemistry. And make it more likely for me to have a panic attack. So after I had the panic attack, I stopped doing drugs and started seeing a shrink regularly. And that is what ultimately, actually it took me a couple of years, but ultimately led me to meditation. Right, and it was, was it because of the PTSD that you were experiencing from the stuff that you've seen in Iraq, Palestine, Israel, like as you were going, because you were going through, it was like a multi-year journey of you doing investigative reporting down there pretty much like the worst point, right? In 2002, 2003-ish? Yeah, I mean, I was in Afghanistan in 2001, a couple of weeks after 9-11. Um, a uh, couple of weeks after, crazy. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I actually did an embed with the Taliban while they were still in power. Um, I actually have one of the last Taliban visas available in a passport, so... Um, so that really, I mean, and I was young, I was 30 at the time. Uh, and that's kicked me off into this kind of addiction of combat reporting. So I was in Afghanistan a bunch. I was at, uh, when they almost caught Osama bin Laden to Tora Bora, I was there. And then I covered the second intifada in Israel uh, and Palestine. And then when the Iraq war happened, I was there for months and months and months. And I don't want to oversell my combat experience because there are many reporters who have way more than me but i did a lot of it and it was very exciting but i wouldn't say i got ptsd it was more like i was addicted to the adrenaline and when i would come home even though my life at home was pretty exciting i was still a tv reporter and getting to anchor the national news and cover presidential campaigns and whatever i, I it does nothing measures up to being in a war zone I don't recommend it, by the way, but uh, it, it's hard to beat that in terms of adrenaline. And I got depressed and didn't know I was depressed and then started to self-medicate. What were the things that you were seeing there? I mean, what was the lifestyle there? I mean, how were they even accommodating you when you were going through this? And what was it like? Can you paint us a picture in terms of what it was really like? Uh, this, I'll start with my first experience when I went in with the Taliban. Uh, they had their their stronghold was a city in southern Afghanistan called Kandahar, and when I went in, the American military was actively bombing Kandahar, uh, but we uh, gave them a heads up that we were going in, um, and they would not guarantee our safety. They said, "Don't go," but we did it anyway, and we knew that they knew where we were. And uh, the Taliban put us up in like some guest houses. It was not fancy, but um, it wasn't horrible. It was just a small group of journalists, and um, you, know, you could hear the shell, the bombing at night. And during the day, they would take us to see the the places that had been bombed, and they would try to make it out like, you know, they were the victims, mm. uh, which was not very convincing. I mean, 
uh, I, anyway, we could go into great depth about that. But And then just to pick another war zone, Iraq, in the months before the war broke out, we stayed at a, a sort of famous hotel called the Al Rashid, uh, which was built by Saddam. And actually, when you walked into the hotel, there was a mosaic on the floor of George H.W. Bush, who had launched the first Gulf War. A great sign of respect is to a great sign of disrespect is to show anybody in the Arab world the bottoms of your feet. So the fact that you had to walk over his face was meant as a diss. Uh, and so they put all the journalists in that hotel. And that was odd because living in a totalitarian dictatorship is very surreal. There's no crime except for the crime committed by the state. So Baghdad was actually a very safe place to be. There were hundreds of journalists there. We had like an active social life. You could walk around the city. It was, of course, it was terrible to, you know, it's dictatorships are not great, but it was rel- surreally safe. Um, mm-hmm. Then the war broke out and uh, we were moved to a different hotel. And uh, then over the course of the following years where I would go back and forth many, many times, we often would stay, the news outlets would um, rent sort of compounds that were heavily guarded with private security, Mm. Um, a mixture of foreign, meaning sort of US, UK, ex special forces folks, and then with some local security guards. Um, And you'd live in these compounds and travel around in armored vehicles, it's extremely dangerous. Um, But like I said, really interesting and really exciting. And were you ever experiencing any near life threats or danger throughout that experience or is it like a con is it like a constant worry that you're having in the back of your head um yes and yes again i don't want to overstate there are you know i'm thinking of correspondents who have had way more experience in combat zones like richard engel from nbc or martha raddatz my colleague from abc or a very close friend of mine bob woodruff from abc who actually got hit by a bomb wow. uh, but that being said, for sure, I've been in many situations where um, there's there are there's bombs or shelling happening nearby. I've been shot at a bunch of times. Um, oh my god! So very active kinetic situations where you're either embedded with troops who are you know in firefights or actively raiding people's homes, or uh, some, many times been in war zones where it's. Um, you're not embedded. You're just on your own. Um, and yeah, that's pretty hairy. My God, I'm sure you're under, understating it. I mean, it, it, the fact that you were there alone is is enough, right? The fact that you're putting yourself in, in danger to report these. I mean, it's 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 a hell of a hell of a job that you signed up for. Um, that must have been that must have been crazy. It was a couple of years that you were there for that, right? Were you flying back all the time back to to New York? Every yeah, I would months. say it started in 2001, and I was pretty active until 2006 or seven. Um, and I would spend big chunks of time at home, and then and then go back overseas for more chunks of time. But there were, I would say, 2003 and four, maybe just mostly 2003. I was almost never home. Like I, I don't know how I paid bills or anything like that, and. Friends would stay at my apartment, and uh, it was it was, you know, there was nothing but like mustard in the fridge. It was it was pretty bleak. Uh, but you know, it, it, there's a real camaraderie that comes. You know, you get very close with people. I still have very good friends who I made in those days, and um, and you feel like you're doing something very important. You know, bearing witness to the tip of the spear, which is funded by American tax dollars in many cases and so it's I it felt like a big responsibility and if I'm being honest there was a lot of you know uh, ambition and curiosity and thrill seeking involved too so it's a you know I, I think about human motivation as a complicated cocktail of of things pure altruism is hard to find um, we, are, we tend to have very complicated motives if we're okay looking at them uh, for the things we do and um yeah so there was a lot it's a lot it's pretty rich psychological area for me yeah no kidding and when you were going back to america and you just 
for the first time seeing that contrast to a completely normal life to from going back from where you were in Afghanistan. Is there a part of you where that you actually missed that excitement the moment you got back? Was there a part of you that wanted to go back? Yeah. Yeah, for sure. It wasn't just part of me. It was so much. It was huge. I, I remember there was one experience I had in like 2002 where I had been in, I'd been covering at the, the second Intifada, which was the Palestinian uprising against the Israelis. Um, and it was pretty gnarly. Uh, and we were living in, uh, when the Israelis invaded the capital of the West Bank, the city called Ramallah, which is where Yasser Arafat, who at that time was the head of the PLO, was living. And um, the journalists were all staying in this one house. Um, and it, the, it's, houses on the street were getting hit. Um, and it was a really active war zone. And they were, um, yeah, I remember one day they dug up a hole in the, the Palestinians dug a hole in the parking lot of the hospital to dump the excess bodies because the wars were overflowing. It was really intense. And I came home from that and went back to work and was just doing sort of day-to-day -day domestic coverage for ABC News. And um, I don't know, I was in a bad mood. Uh, I don't know, I, I didn't have a lot of self-awareness at the time, but I knew I, I, just, I was kind of bickering with some of my bosses and, um, it just, well, things weren't going well for me. And then one day they told me, you're going back. And so I remember I flew in, I was tired, and I got off the plane, and um, it was incredibly hot. Um, and I saw two Palestinians get into a gunfight. And uh, after that happened, we got in the car and left, and I fell asleep in the car, and I woke up on the side of the road in this beautiful West Bank. The West Bank is beautiful. We were on our way back to our headquarters in Jerusalem, and we had stopped to eat some fresh watermelon from a vendor on the side of the road. A Palestinian guy was selling watermelon, and I was eating the watermelon and looking off at the view, and I realized I'm not in a bad mood anymore. Whoa. And that, yeah, it just tells you, like, it becomes this fix you need. Wow. And you almost felt more comfortable. You felt more at, at yourself at this place of chaos. Yes, yes. Wow. So you come back to the US and you've had this four year stint living this chaotic life that you enjoyed and you now have to live a normal life for normal life, I mean, as a news anchor. Um, and it sounds like you said you led to, that led you to drugs, I guess, to help you keep that high that you had from this chaos. What kind of drugs were you doing at that time? I, I, when I came home, I, I spent about six months on and off in Iraq in, in like this big chunk of time that they said the invasion of Iraq was in March of 2003. I went over in December and was living there for several months until the invasion happened. I left and went to nearby Jordan for a couple of days during the height of the invasion and then went back in for another month in Baghdad. And then I went home for a little bit and then I went back for another month. So it was about six months total. And I, when I came home from that final trip, it was July or August, I developed what I thought was some sort of mystery illness. I was having trouble getting out of bed. I felt like I was like kind of had a low grade fever all the time. And it wasn't like my life was boring. I was actually getting my first experience. I was getting these opportunities to, to anchor Good Morning America, which was, I mean, I was 32, 33 or something like that. It was like a really great opportunity. So things were going well on some level. Um, but I was just feeling shitty and I had never done drugs. I mean, I mean, I smoked a little weed and I drank a lot as most, you know, high school and colleges, college kids do. And, um, but I wasn't a particularly heavy drinker at this point in my life and wasn't very interested in drugs, but I was having, I'd always said no when it was offered to me. Uh, and then I was, I was out one night and a friend of mine offered me some cocaine and I don't know why I said yes. And I did it, and I felt better. Hmm. And, and it wasn't like my life became, you know, Bright Lights, Big City, or, you know, the Wolf of Wall Street, you know, just pounding quaaludes all the time or whatever. But I, I, I started doing it occasionally. You know, I, uh, there were weeks would go by where I didn't do it at all. But then 
I would, you know, really go for it. Um, and it always just made me feel better. And I had no, this is a, a, just a case study in mindlessness, which is the opposite of what we developed in meditation, which is mindfulness, where you have a, a sense of what's going on between your ears. I didn't. Um, and it just led to a calamity because as discussed, I changed my brain chemistry and then freaked out on television, basically nearly derailed my career. And do you find that it was a way for you to kind of escape the real reality that you were living in, perhaps because of something that you were suppressing from the experiences you've had? I don't think so. I, 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 uh, I don't, I don't think the problem was that I was traumatized. Uh, I don't think that, you know, the, my exposure to this, while not insignificant, was not nearly the exposure that my more seasoned colleagues had or have, never mind what members of the military get. So I don't think I came home with trauma. I think I came, I think I liked it too much. I think I was addicted to the adrenaline and I was making up for the lack of adrenaline with a synthetic squirt of, a, of adrenaline from the cocaine. As a, and by the way, cocaine isn't like a hallucinatory drug or, uh, or even like alcohol where you can get totally numbed. Alcohol is a depressant. If you take too much of it, you're just out of it. It's not really the case with cocaine or ecstasy, which is the other drug I was into. It's more of like a heightened experience. Hmm. It's exciting. And um, so it's like you're more awake. You're more alive. And... Yet again, I do not recommend it. I think it has many, many psychological and physiological downsides. I, um, but it was fun at the time, and that's what I was looking for, not an escape. More like I wanted to be back in the heightened experiences I was having overseas. Yeah, yeah. And the thing, I guess I haven't done cocaine often, but I've done more psychedelics. And I know ecstasy has a huge calm down in terms of you know, you get so much dopamine level in your brain when you're on your height, and then the day you get the, the hangover, I guess, after, or you're severely depressed. And then, and then you're kind of spent for a day or two afterwards, and it's, it's pretty brutal. Um, psychedelics, I've not really done much of. I'm very intrigued by the research into psychedelics um, and what we're seeing with mushrooms and... Um, uh, LSD, but also ayahuasca, peyote. It's all very, very intriguing. And it's, mm. there's a big interse increasing intersection these days between meditation and psychedelics. And some of the teachers um, that I'm particularly close with now that I'm basically like a full-time meditation, whatever, uh, some of the really experienced teachers that I'm close with are very into combining, particularly ayahuasca with meditation practice. So I think there's that is really rich. I again, I can't speak with any experience. I haven't done it myself, but it's. I know people who have, and it sounds very intriguing. Yeah, yeah, I haven't done ayahuasca either. I mean, it seems like it's a different level of of what you can experience with LSD. But it does give overall recreational drugs kind of a bad rep because now there is research coming out from John Hopkins about the benefits of LSD and shrooms, particularly in treating PTSD. Which is why I thought originally I thought that's what you're doing after chaotic experiences that you've had but yeah nevertheless when you're mixing up lsd before with like weed even and and cocaine and all this ecstasy it kind of gives this overall branding a bad name um i think i think like the war on drugs was started by nixon right and that that kind of started off everything in this in the states yes yeah i i i agree with you and i uh, you know these these plant medicines as they're often referred to these uh, psychedelics are, I think, at a completely different level than the more common drugs of abuse. Now, you can abuse anything, um, uh, and I don't recommend taking these drugs unsupervised. The, the, the way the, the psychedelics that the, my interest in them is where they're delivered in a really controlled environment. Often, the ling lingo in psychedelic world is set and setting. And that seems, from my removed perch, to be really important, that you're in the right setting, the right dosage, with people who know how to catch you if you fall, um, and you're doing it in a controlled environment rather than, you know, at a cake party. Hmm. And how is uh, things like psychedelics or LSD uh, integrated with meditation? What are the experts saying these days? 
Uh, well, I don't know. Um, you know, the, I don't know what the scientists have to say about this, and I don't know how much. I know there's been some study. Johns Hopkins did a big research program, and I can't recall or don't know the results of it. But um, Roland Griffiths, who I've not met, but I have great respect for, uh, who's a scientist at Johns Hopkins, did some research, or maybe in the process of doing research on long-term meditators and uh, psilocybin, which is the active ingredient in mushrooms. Mm -hmm. um, but what I do know from people who practice retreats, there are retreats that are conducted mostly in Central and South America, where you have meditation teachers and shamans together taking people for a week or two, and you're doing large doses of meditation every day. And then there are a few what they call ceremonies where there, the drug is administered or the plant medicine is administered during the during the course of the retreat. And one teacher who I'm a massive fan of, her name is Spring Washam, W-A-S-H-A-M, Spring Washam. She, pre-pandemic, was doing a ton of these retreats in Peru. And she had an enormous amount of meditation experience and an enormous amount of experience with, uh, with ayahuasca. And she describes it, the combination, as an accelerator. You know, meditation at the deep end uh, is a path uh, toward, you know, allegedly, I, I, I haven't gone on this path, I'm not enlightened, but it's meditation, you know, from, from its original conception was designed as a, path, a practice that takes you on a path that leads you toward enlightenment, whatever that means. And Spring was way further down that path than I am. Her belief is that these medicines are an accelerator down that path. Right, right. Yeah, I, I think I've seen a video about, you know, you don't necessarily need these psychedelics, but the alternative way to do it is to go on like a major fasting sprint where you don't eat for multiple days. That gives you this like hallucinogen effect of uh, that you can kind of just get through LSD. But yeah, because of the way it's branded, it's, it's, it's just not been really accessible but hopefully these studies are going to certainly open up the world in terms of what's possible. That's great. To be clear, I, I don't think you need, sorry to interrupt, I just, just to be clear, that I don't think you need, you know, like I said, I haven't done this. I'm intrigued by it, but I haven't done it. Um, I'm a little scared of it, to be honest with you. Um, After cocaine and uh, ecstasy? Not because of that. It's just that I, you know, I used to have a, I have a panic disorder. So, like, the, mm. the, the, the possibility of freaking out seems quite high. Um, the, uh, but, but just what I was going to say is like, you, you don't need to go to extremes like fasting or taking the, the psychedelics. And again, I don't maybe it's not fair to describe them as extreme, but you don't have to do that to have really powerful experiences. If you do a seven, 10 or 14 day or even longer meditation retreat, um, you're going to, the odds are you're, you'll have interesting experiences. I don't know what they'll be. Um, and everybody, every mind is different, but I've done six or seven of long retreats, you know, uh, eight, nine, 10, 11 days. And yeah, I've had very exper interesting experiences of my own mind. Mm. Is that the, um, is that the retreat with, with, with the woman? You're saying there's no drugs involved or anything like that. There's no fasting involved. It was just going through her training process. No, so, uh, you know, there are meditation retreat centers all over the world, really, but it, um, I'm mostly familiar with the ones in the United States. And these have no, there are no drugs. It's, uh, it's just, you know, if you're interested in meditation and you want to go deeper than just doing a few minutes a day, you can actually go on a retreat and live at a center. You're kind of like a monk for seven to 10 days or however long the retreat is. And they give you their food and you have teachers there instructing you. And basically you get up at 530 or 5 in the morning and you meditate all day until you go to bed. And it's just incredibly high dose of meditation. And uh, and there's no talking or very little talking. And you're just meditating. And you will, uh, you will have experiences. They may suck. Uh, and that more common for me is it sucks and then it's amazing and then it sucks again. Mm. But that to me is quite different. The knock on psychedelics, and again, I'm by no means anti-psychedelic, I'm very intrigued, is, is that if you have that experience once, this sort of peak experience, 
it's hard to integrate it into your life. You don't really know how to get back into that state of mind. So then you may not change the way you are in the world as a consequence, whereas meditation is more akin to exercise, where you are doing it regularly and it's pounding the wisdom, the learnings into your neurons systematically. And to me, that's really the power of it. The, the notion that we are, that we're not stuck with all these characteristics of our inner life that we may not like our stinginess, our anger, our uh, lack of empathy. These are, these are all skills, as it turns out. This is what the science is showing us. The science of meditation is showing us that the brain, and by extension the mind, are, are trainable. And so for me, that, that's what's so exciting. Whereas it, it's, instead of having just one huge experience, you're, you're doing this as a daily practice and occasionally going into the dojo on retreat and really going for it. And that, over time, can have really interesting effects on a human life. Yeah, no, I agree with that. I, I, that's the common feedback that I get is like you had this amazing experience when you first do LSD, but you don't. Well, first of all, you build up a tolerance really quickly, so the the chances of you doing it again and having the same effect is like rare, unless you wait a couple of years. And you, as you said, it, it is hard to go back into into that mode. I actually did. Uh, Vipassana, I think that's what you're referring to, like the 10 day yeah. solid yeah. meditation trip. I did mine in uh, Hawaii, Big Island. Um, where, did, where did you do yours? Uh, so, the Vipassana retreats that you're talking about is uh, th those are run by this now deceased um, Indian gentleman named S.N. Goenka. Um, and though they, he has centers all over the world. Mm -hmm. I mostly go to a place that does a very similar form of practice, Buddhist practice in um, Massachusetts, and it's called the Insight Meditation Society, and they have a sister organization on the West Coast of the United States called Spirit Rock. Mm. Gotcha, gotcha. And you are you still doing the 10 days, or do you go back for like three days at a time now? I try to do once a year-ish, uh, uh, 9, 10, 11 day retreat I'm going to do because the center's closed right now I'm going to do one with some friends mm -hmm. uh, for a couple weeks in the fall um, and it's really a way to take your daily practice which however long it is you know 5, 10 in my case I try to do about 60 minutes a day but I you know I divide it up throughout the day um, it's a way to take that daily practice and really accelerate it you know to have with a concentrated high dose of the practice um, and you know that's where in my experience the real if you're a nerd a meditation nerd as I am that's where the real sort of advances in your practice can happen yeah yeah well I'd be curious to know because after doing it I did mine maybe six years ago or something like that first time ever doing meditation didn't know anything about it and I get there and I'm barely aware of the rules at that point and like they're telling me that I can't make eye contact with anyone there's no electronics there's no touching uh, uh you can't even bring anything to read or write you're literally on your own with the men and women are segregated and i forgot my tent too so i was in this small little tent just stuck and forced to be in my own thoughts for the first time as an extrovert was one of the most difficult things particularly the seventh day i think they warn you about that right it's like a seventh day droll and that's like when it really hits you. And I just started like balling up at 2 a.m. It was like one of the most difficult things I've ever had to go on through for the first time. And I'm sure it was similar for you, I imagine. I mean, it was ve it's very difficult, um, but it also can be uh, transcendent. You know, um, I always hate, I always dread going on retreat. And the first couple of days are wretched usually. Um, in my experience, not rely, not, I can't guarantee this for anybody. And if you go in with expectations, you're likely to have them dashed. But in my experience, by day five, actually, I usually stop fighting it as I've like punched myself out. And I'm, you know, I'm, I don't have the energy to fight the, the container anymore. And so I surrender into it. And that surrender, and I don't mean that in the pejorative, I mean like a positive relaxing into the reality of the situation is incredibly can be incredibly transformative where you 
find, in my experience, I found myself waking up to the, I, I realized that I've spent all of my life in either projection into the future or rumination about the past. And instead, I'm like right here awake right now. And that is often a, a thrilling experience. And, uh, you know, it doesn't last. I mean, one of the things you're supposed to see on a meditation retreat is that nothing lasts. Our minds are just this racing all the time. And that's an incredibly powerful realization because when you see how how your mind is racing all the time, how you're grasping onto the pleasant and rejecting the unpleasant and planning and plotting and et cetera, et cetera. When you see that, you're less owned by it. And that is an incredibly valuable skill because we have this nonstop conversation running in our head all the time. And if we broadcast that aloud, you would be locked up, right? Because you know what's going on in your head. It's not pretty. And, uh, but what meditation does is kind of drag that stuff into the light and you see, uh, it's changing all the time. You, it, you're not really responsible for much of it. You didn't invite these, you know, thoughts about donuts on day six or, or of your retreat or two minutes into your daily meditation or whatever, that the mind is this cacophonous. It's out of our control. And then you can, it, it you cannot take it so personally. And that, I mean, that may sound a little um, grandiose, but let me just give you some examples. You you might find in your daily life, uh, you're less likely to obey the thought of, hey, let's eat 75 Oreos because we're stressed. Or you may be less likely to say something that's going to ruin the next 48 hours of your marriage. Um, You start not being yanked around so much by all of your random thoughts and urges and powerful emotions. And that is a new way to live. And that's very compelling. And you don't need to go on a retreat to achieve that. A daily practice of 5, 10, 15, 20 minutes will get you there. Uh, but retreat is a great place to train that up. And the reason why they take away your phone and tell you not to have eye contact um, and all these seemingly strange and to be silent most of the time, these the seemingly strange rules are designed so that you're not breaking your concentration and you're not breaking anybody else's concentration. You're really focused on being mindful, awake, paying attention as much as you humanly can. Um, and not every retreat is designed that way, but most of the retreats I've done are designed that way. And it's, and it's not supposed to make you stuck in your thoughts. And in fact, it's supposed to get you out of the thinking mind and into your direct sensory experience. So like, what does it feel like in your body right now? What are you hearing, seeing, smelling, tasting? We, we are, we spend so much time locked in these discursive loops instead of experiencing our life as it actually is happening. And that is a really powerful thing to taste. The biggest thing that I got was that just being able to observe these negative thoughts crawling into your brain, you can almost, it's like a slow motion. It's like, oh, wow, I didn't even realize I was aware that I had these thoughts. Before, it was just like a subconscious thing. And I realized I was in a bad mood at 3 p.m. because I had all of these thoughts and I wasn't even aware of it. And to be able to think about it and realize that I was having these thoughts and then place my focus on something else in a conscious manner, that was really one of the most powerful things that I got from the retreat. And, and I'm sure it was for a lot of people as well. Yeah, I mean, that, that, that is the insight. That is the insight that these, ret- or at least the initial insight that these retreats are trying to get from you. And that's why they have these funny rules, because they want you to be as focused as possible on, uh, I believe in a Goenka retreat, it starts with a body scan and yeah. then moves to breath, or, or maybe the other way around. It was like the head, they, yeah, from the head, yeah. So you, there, are, there are a number of ways to do this. You can start by just sit, uh, systematically being aware of the sensations at the top of your head and then moving down through your face and neck, et cetera, through the body over and over again, or more commonly in the, re- in the retreats that I attend, you just pick the breath, uh, you know, at the belly or the chest or the nose, and you're not breathing in a special way. You just feel the breath coming in and going out, and then you're going to get distracted a million times, and then you start again and again and again. And over time, what this does is it slows your, th- it's after days of this, the thinking process slows way down and then you get a kind of front row seat of your at your at the workings of your own mind that's what happened to you you described being able to see these negative thoughts creeping into the mind whereas before you didn't have the self awareness for it 
because you're 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 owned by that you're in the thoughts you're inhabiting the thoughts instead of being able to step out of them which is what meditation allows us to do and again this sounds you know kind of abstract maybe to some people or woo woo but it's it, you know is is it mindfulness which is the self awareness that we all have is a birthright for all of us we're our species our designation of our species is homo sapiens sapiens two sapiens and that is the one who uh, thinks and knows he or she thinks, homo sapiens sapiens. So, but we're, we're all stuck in the thinking instead of being able to step out of it and know that we're thinking, that you are not your thoughts. And when you get that, then you have much more control over your life. You can respond wisely to things instead of reacting blindly. Yeah, yeah. The, the other interesting thing was just being able to not talk anyone throughout the whole experience, right? So you have all these preconceived notions of what people are going to be like, because you're seeing them every day from afar. Obviously, you're not supposed to make contact and, you know, eye contact or touch. And then on day 10 at the end is when you can finally start to talk to everyone and understand why they're there. And it's fascinating to me how wrong my judgments were of people <laughs> From the moment that I met that one guy had like these pink dreadlocks coming in and he was like one of the most fascinating characters that I met on day 10 and people had real problems like my problem felt so small compared to what a lot of these people were dealing with and they were leading they were relying on meditation to to really calm their anxiety and it just goes to show how powerful it is for people yep I've had that experience many times where you get a whole story about somebody and then you meet them on uh, at the end of the retreat and you realize you just made it all up. And by the way, we're doing that all the time. By the way, that is also the roots of racism, you know, because we are wired to make snap judgments about people because it, it, it helped us it stay safe on the, you know, to quickly decide, is that a, a stick I see on the ground or a snake? So the mind is constantly telling stories and making judgments. This is, we have biases that are evolutionarily wired. But then, uh, you know, now I, I might walk down the street and see somebody of a different pigmentation and I tell myself a whole story and this is how uh, we get discrimination. Uh, but unpacking that through meditation is incredibly powerful. Absolutely, absolutely. And I know one of the other things that you delved into after this experience was Buddhism. I'd really love to know more about because uh, obviously this is not as popular in Western cultures. Like I looked it up, it's like far majority is in the U is in the, is in Asia, and it's it's not really well known here. People are aware of it, but they don't really know the practice of it, what it really stands for. Um, so I'd love to dig into like what got you into the the religion, uh, what you've learned from it, and and what's that experience been like for you. First to say that. The meditation, it's very possible to meditate in a secular environment. Uh, the meditation that we offer on the 10% Happier app, as you know, is, is not overtly Buddhist. Um, so that's the first thing to say. You, you, you know, the mindfulness meditation is, uh, you know, there are forms of mindfulness meditation that are really deliberately de-emphasizing uh, the religious roots, not as out of, sign of, out of a sign of disrespect, but to make it accessible and make it um, legit to do it in places like schools and prisons and um, and corporations, et cetera, et cetera. So that's actually been a very healthy thing. So initially, I was interested in meditation as somebody who's a pretty skeptical, secular guy. I'm I'm pretty devout agnostic. Um, I was interested in meditation because it was secularized. Over time, though, I started to get interested in the Buddhist roots of the practice. And one thing you learn is that, you know, while Buddhism is practiced as a faith in many parts of the world, you, the Buddha himself was quite explicit that you do not have to adopt any of his metaphysical claims if you don't want to. In fact, he said, don't believe it just because I'm saying it. So I don't know if I believe in reincarnation, even though I would call myself a Buddhist. I don't know if I believe in enlightenment uh, or karma, mm -hmm. but I do know that these practices are profoundly impactful. And so I, uh, while, while Buddhism is a faith, and I have no disrespect for its more um, 
sort of religious aspects. I practice it. Uh, one of my favorite expressions about Buddhism is it's not something to believe in. It's something to do. And in that sense, I'm a Buddhist. Yeah, and, and it, it seems more graspable. I mean, he, he's also like a real guy. He was a real person that was, yes. that was here. He would never refer to him as a god. And I'm also secular. I'm not, I'm not religious by any means. And I actually didn't like the fact that the 10-day meditation had some, it wasn't, it wasn't like a religious component, but there were some components that they were trying to, it almost felt like they were trying to reel you in. Um, so I want to be objective about that. Like I think I think it's important for people to take what they enjoy about specific experiences or, or religion and apply it in their lives. Um, but yeah, it seems like Buddhism it's it's it, it's certainly related to meditation and it's a component that you believe in, but it's not necessarily uh, that you're advocating for Buddhism by any means. I mean, you can do you can do whatever you want. I mean, uh, if you want to meditate and have no uh, association with Buddhism or uh, go for it. Uh, I, I don't, for people who are uh, skeptical or secular, or if you've got a pre existing set of religious beliefs that you don't want challenged, I think Buddhism is to also totally safe because, again, you don't, it's not like, it's hard to be, um, it's hard to be an evangelical Christian if you don't believe that Jesus died on the cross and was resurrected. Right? You, that's pretty foundational belief, which is hard, if not impossible, to prove. None of the things that the Buddha talked about, which are hard, if not impossible, to prove, such as rebirth, none of those things are required dogmas to be a Buddhist. You can be a Buddhist because, I mean, I call myself a Buddhist because I do Buddhist meditation, and I read a lot about uh, sort of uh, Buddhist views of the mind. Um and I do Buddhist meditation retreats, et cetera, et cetera. But that is not practicing a religion the way many people think a religion is practiced. Yeah, to me, it seems more like a philosophy rather than a religion. I'm not even sure why they classify it as a, as a religion. Well, it's an applied philosophy. So instead of it just being a thing you think about, it's actually a set of practices you do. It's a way you live your life. It's got ethical um, uh aspects to it it's you know these incredibly deep practices but you know um the it is there are a lot the, i understand why it's called a religion because there are metaphysical claims in it you know uh people uh my buddhist teachers believe in enlightenment and and rebirth and karma and all of these things and even really if you push them many of them believe in like supernatural things the, the idea that deep end meditation can give you powers that's right there in the scriptures too so i understand why met by buddhism is classified as religion what i'm saying though is you can engage it's okay to be a cafeteria buddhist in my in my view um whereas i would say it would be hard to be in even you know, and I hope I'm not offending any, or I hope I'm not wrong, but I've had a reasonable amount of experience with evangelical Christians, and it would be hard to, like, kind of take or leave uh, the basic claims of the faith in the way that you can as a Buddhist. Because what really matters as a Buddhist, are you doing the practices and trying to live an ethical life? Uh, that's what really matters. And, you, you know, the Buddha would say, if you may come to see through doing these practices that the claims he's making are true. And the people that were teaching you these philosophies, what were they saying about reincarnation? What are their beliefs in it? Oh, I remember <laughs> my teacher, the teacher I've worked with for a while is a guy named Joseph Goldstein, who you may have seen on the app. Um, and he, he, has told, he has told me about a quote from his teacher who said it was a uh, an Indian gentleman uh, named Munindra, and uh, he used to say, you don't have to believe rebirth or these other claims, but they're true. <laughs> <laughs> that was his what? attitude. Uh, okay. <laughs> and Joseph is much more open-minded about this stuff than I am. I also think that he's had experiences in 50 years of meditation, 55 years of meditation, that mm. I haven't had. You know, you know, if you, the people I, I, I know very few, strike that, I know zero meditation teachers who've done 
tons of time on the cushion, you know, like years of silent retreat. I know zero hmm. who don't believe some degree of this. And are they at least able to provide specifics? Are we humans from other humans? Is it human to human reincarnation? Are we going to be a bug? Are we going to be a mosquito one day? Like what, what are the specifics? Or are they just putting out a general statement saying that reincarnation exists? So this is not an area where I've done a ton of study, but some of the argument I've the arguments I've heard are that if you think about it, like I believe it's the third law of thermodynamics that no ener like no energy what is it like I can't remember, but something like energy doesn't uh, stop, mm -hmm. you know, it doesn't just dissipate. It, it, ha it has to I don't know something like that. Mm -hmm. Basically, that the mind energy upon death wouldn't just cease. It has to keep going in some, and the Tibetans have a whole, um, and again, I know very little about this, but the Tibetans have a whole uh, view of how this happens. Like after you die, you go into a place called the Bardo, I believe, and then you're ultimately reborn based on the, your own karma. Um, so I don't think it's as uh, me mechanistic as, you know, I hand off my karma, my, my son or is, is, some, or my grandson is some reincarnation of me. Um, the way the Tibetans view it, and again, I, I'm neither an expert in this nor a believer in it, uh, although I do try to maintain an open-minded stance. Um, the way the Tibetans run it is like, for example, the Dalai Lama, when, when a Dalai Lama dies, there's a commission of, of Tibetan leaders who go out into the countryside and select the next one based on various signs and potents and all sorts of things. So, uh, yeah, uh, it's either mysterious or it's made up your, uh, your call. I remember reading about this uh, professor. He's a legit, I think he was a doctor, um, a professor of psychiatry at uh, uh, Virginia School, I believe. And he was talking, he actually was convinced that reincarnation would exist. And he wanted to put science and apply that into it. So what he did was he got around two to 3,000 children who claimed, I don't know if you heard about this, he, 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 they claimed that they were able to recall their lives from, their, from the past. And I think about 40% of them had birth defects or birthmarks. And he was trying to uh, attribute that with with dead people basically and try to match those people based on the lives that they have described by looking at the history of these people that were dead and he found a lot of them to be uh matching for for for, for better or worse until his death in 2007 and i think the whole thing just kind of died down but um that was like the closest thing to bringing science into reincarnation but uh yeah maybe maybe we do reincarnate who knows <laughs> That's the exact right phraseology. Who knows? Because I don't know. Uh, but I think, you know, uh, Joseph, my teacher, likes to talk about a quote from, I believe, Coleridge, the willing suspension of disbelief. So, I, I, you know, that's why agnosticism appeals to me and all of these things. I don't know. Maybe Jesus did die and was reincarnated. I wasn't there. I don't know. I am constitutionally, as the child of a pair of scientists and the husband of another scientist, constitutionally, it's hard for me to believe in things I can't prove. However, uh, over time, I've just gotten better at just being open-minded and make, it, it's entirely possible. Science is revealing new things all the time, like who, the multiverse. It's hard for me to even wrap my mind around that. Um, mm. So I'm not going to sit here and make big claims about how the universe or the multiverse operates, uh, I'm, I'm willing to investigate and hear everybody out. Yeah, yeah. I'm not sure if you're a fan of uh, uh, Nassim Nicholas Taleb. He wrote like the Black Swan, Anti-Fragile, and he talks about this idea of like asymmetric risk and that from a religion perspective, it's actually good to believe in something, whether you're agnostic and you believe that there is something out there, you may not practice religion. Just because with karma and all these things that may exist, if there is an afterlife, uh, the fact that you believed in it, you're able, you're able to gain the benefits of it. Whereas if you don't, nothing really in your life changes. But if there is an afterlife, you don't get to benefit from that. So there is really no risk of believing in something as long as it doesn't change the way you live on a day-to-day -day basis. So I thought that was fascinating. Um, but Absolutely. Uh, well, I want to end it off, Dan. I want to talk a little bit about happiness. Obviously, your book, 10% Happier, 
is something that has been core to the meditation, the practice that you do. Uh, and I enjoy the fact that it's really this tiny effect. You didn't call it 50% happier. You didn't call it 100% happier. You, you set expectations realistically, which is 10%. Um, and you, you talk about like incremental gains. Uh, wh why did you choose this idea of incremental gains rather than 50%, which probably could have sold more books? <laughs> I was trying to, I had spent some time in the reporting and, and research and writing of the book. I had spent some time in the um, self-help world and I was very uh, disappointed by what I found there. And, and I, I think there is a lot of over-promising, a sort of reckless hope that is peddled that you can solve all of your problems through the power of positive thinking or whatever. And what I found from meditation was that it did not solve all of my problems, but it really had a positive effect. And I, my goal was just to add it into the pantheon of no brainers, like getting enough sleep, exercising, eating well, seeing a shrink if you need it, taking medication if you need it, getting access to nature, having good relationships, all the things we know through science that are key, compo key components of a healthy mind and body. Meditation, when I was writing the book, uh, you know, this was a while ago, I started meditating like 2009. At that point, it was still kind of a fringy practice. And the goal of writing the book um, was to try to push it further into the mainstream. Um, and 10% happier was just kind of like a jokey way to talk about that. Mm, gotcha, gotcha. Uh, but it does make sense. I mean, the fact that uh, for to tell someone that you're going to be two times happier, it just doesn't even make any sense, right? But but there is massive compound power and like compound returns when the way we invest our knowledge and, and yes. including our happiness if we're able to do it on a daily basis. So yes. yeah. Well, I, I wanna leave it off the audience here with one small but actionable step down. We, we usually end it off with something that the audience members can take. I, I would hope that there is a good portion of people that are already meditating, but for people that are not there they still think it's like woo woo or wacky as, as both of us did at one point in our lives uh or, or they're facing unhappiness because of what's happening around the world with covid and all that stuff what is a small but actionable step that someone can take right after listening to this episode to help make their day better help them get into a more mindfulness lifestyle i mean i would recommend meditation and i and the thing to say is that forming new habits is diabolically difficult we are not wired through evolution to easily make or break habits. So just knowing that is actually liberating because then you can approach habit formation with a, a lightness and a sense of humor and a will and a resilience, a willingness to try something uh, through experimentation. And then when you fall off the wagon to start again and again and again, and not to feel like you're broken or malfunctioning because you're falling off the wagon, everybody does. So the two little mantras I have, to help people get over the hump and actually do this thing. One is one minute counts. I would love to see people meditating for five, 10, 15 minutes a day. That's great, but it's it sound it's intimidating to a lot of people. One minute really does count. And we have a bunch of one minute meditations on the app, but you don't have to use my app. You know, there are plenty of good apps out there, or you can just set a timer. Uh, and the instructions are pretty simple. Just try to focus on your breath. And then when you get distracted, start again. Uh, so one minute counts, and then daily-ish is my other little mantra. Because it would be great if you were doing it every day, but uh, often we tell ourselves we're going to do something every day, and then the first day we miss, our ego or the voice in our head or whatever swoops in and tells us, oh, you're fail you failed at this. So daily-ish builds in sort of an elasticity or a psychological flexibility, to use the technical term, that helps people sort of get... Um, grounded in the practice and then once you've done it a little bit then you then you and you've seen the benefits then you switch from this sort of extrinsic external motivation i'm doing it because dan told me to to an intrinsic internal motivation like i'm doing this because it makes me saner and that is where the magic happens beautiful beautiful we'll definitely link out the app make sure you guys go check out 10 percent happier the book 10% Happier, the app. And uh, is there anything else where people can find you online? Do you, do you have a personal website where people can link to? I do I do a podcast called 10% Happier. It, it's uh, We post it twice a week. 
uh, or actually do three. We do an episode on Monday and then Wednesday, and then we do a bonus on Friday with like a guy, free guided meditation. Good for so, you guys. Wow. That's a lot of work. Do. It's a ton of work. It's a ton of work. <laughs> um, but it's awesome. We talk to scientists who research happiness. We talk to a ton of meditation teachers. Uh, we talk to famous people who meditate. It's, it's, uh, it's been around for about four years. It's been a lot of fun. Awesome. We'll definitely link all that. Thanks so much, Dan, for coming on. Thank you guys for coming in for another episode. And uh, we'll see you guys next week. 